Talk us through the day of the incident itself. Nothing was really odd about that day besides play that MetLife Stadium went through my same routine. And every time we play versus one of those service teams, Army, Navy, you know it's going to be a battle. Those guys are savages. So you know it's going right. to be a tough game. We just tied it up 17 to 17 in the fourth quarter. I had run down. I kicked off hundreds of times before that. My teammate got down there about a half a second before I did, and he dove at Malcolm's legs. Malcolm's body twirled in the air. I put my head down thinking it wasn't going to be an attack at all. And the crown of my head went right into the back of his shoulder blade. Did you know how serious it was in the moment? I didn't think it was too serious until Coach Shiano looks at me and he goes, E, you have to pray right now. Well, Eric Legrand, welcome to the podcast. We're going to start off by, you're talking about the Legrand bourbon. I'm going to taste it. So as I'm sipping on this, I'm going to put the mic down. I want, to, I want you to tell me the story of how this all came to be. So during the pandemic, as many things came to ideas, but actually came to fruition, not a lot of them did. This one did. And I remember reaching out to my business partner who's here today, Brian Axel, and I told him I wanted to get into the spirits business. Brian looks at me, he goes, yeah, you and everybody else. So my story with, with when it comes to just spirits and just alcohol in general, people see me out and about and they're like, wow, you can drink? And I'm like, just because I have a spot going to drive in a wheelchair doesn't mean I can't enjoy the finer things of life. <laughs> yes, I get it. Some people have medical things that they can't, but that's not everyone. And it's ever since that time, I'm like, I'm going to end that stigma. Like, it used to bother me like that people thought that. So right. I reached out to Brian. I'm like, you know, I want to get into this. He calls me back the next day. He goes, you know what? Your story's unique. It's not going anywhere. You know, people really love you. They support you. And it's something that we really think that we can grow this thing into a great brand one day. So we decided we were going to do bourbon because, one, it fits who I am. It takes time, as you know, John, the patience to make this. You can't make bourbon overnight. It takes no, time. You can't. So... It's gritty, it's, it's, and it's something that, you know, you look at, you're like, you know what, after a long, hard day, I'm going to pour me a glass of bourbon on the rocks, and, you know, whatever it feels, a good day or a bad day, you're going to drink that and just enjoy your night and get a good night's sleep after that, that's you said, for sure. You said on the rocks, but exactly, yeah, exactly man, why the name the rocks, is, is what it is, man. That's awesome, and what, what, a, what a pitch you got. You got that down. You've done that before. A few times. A few right? times, bro. I like and that. I always tell though, it's authentic as it gets. Like, I live this life every single day with a spinal cord injury, and we tell this story through a bottle of bourbon and Brian's idea was he said hopefully that long when we're all got off this earth this bottle this is exactly why it's named Eric Legrand because I remember I was coming up with all different names and Brian's like screw that like we're not doing that shit we're putting your name on that <laughs> bottle Eric Legrand Kentucky straight bourbon so when we're not here anymore that bottle will be able to sit on the back shelf and people will know right you know that's that's Eric Legrand and his story from there and I said that to me I'm like Let's go. Let's That's the yeah, man. It's so funny. My dad will always say the same thing about drinking, right? The whole thing about like our page and our brand was that it's less about drinking and more about the experience and the people mm -hmm. you're with and the story behind whatever that bottle is that you grabbed. And the Eric Legrand story is like none other. You know what I mean? Like you went through what you went through, revolutionized the sport now. You know, they, they changed rules because of you. <laughs> and now you're trying to revolutionize a different space and a different market. So kudos to you. Definitely agree with the whole, like, like and you have a sick name. Eric Legrand is a <laughs> If you had, like, a, a basic-ass boring name, I'd be like, all right, maybe change it up. <laughs> Eric Legrand is great. So I, I am a full um, believer in the the name. I like the bottle itself. I think the juice is delicious. So congrats mm -hmm. to you, man, and, and best of luck. But before we get into all that, I want to just give a little bit of a backstory of who you are. I want to hear it from your vantage point. So I grew up in Jersey, play football, Wayne Valley, knew who you were, right? Because you're, 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 you're a Jersey guy through and through, right? You played ball in Woodbridge growing up, mm -hmm. Colonial, right? Went to Colonial High yeah, School. Yeah. Yes, I did. And obviously played at Rutgers for two and a half years until the injury occurred, but you were playing prior to, like you were on special teams, getting involved with the rotation. 2010 hits, you're a junior. Talk us through the the day of the incident itself. It's crazy, like it was nothing was really odd about that day besides playing at MetLife Stadium, went through my same routine. And every time we play versus one of those service teams, Army, Navy, you know it's gonna be a battle, those guys are savages so you know it's gonna right. be a tough game going up against them is four we just tied it up 17 to 17 in the fourth quarter i had run down i kick off hundreds of times before that had two guys gonna block me got right through them on that particular kickoff and i knew i had about a 30 yard head start on malcolm brown the player i was gonna make this tackle on i said do i want to use my head or do i want to use my shoulder so i'm gonna use my shoulder on this because i know it's gonna be a big collision when my teammate got down there about a half a second before i did and he dove at malcolm's legs Malcolm's body twirled in the air. I put my head down thinking it wasn't going to be an attack at all. 
and the crown of my head went right into the back of his shoulder blade. I fractured my C3, C4 vertebrae, and he broke his collarbone on that plane. And people say, what was that feeling like? And I say, scariest moment of my life. I couldn't feel anything. That was my follow-up question was, did you know how serious it was in the moment? I actually didn't because I've had a, a stinger in my shoulder before. Yeah. A lot of football players <laughs> yeah, know what a stinger feels sure. like. And I've knocked the wind out of myself before. Yeah. And that's what it felt like. My body went numb like a stinger. And then I felt, and I couldn't breathe, so I'm like, I knocked the wind out of myself somehow, some way. And I'm like, you know, I'm like, it's obviously serious, but I didn't think it was too serious until Coach Shiano looks at me and he goes, E, you have to pray right now. And when I couldn't move and I couldn't breathe, and Coach is like, you got to pray. I'm like, this is it, my, like, I can't move, I can't do anything. And I'm not going to lie, at one point I closed my eyes and I said, God, take me at ease, that's it. And as nothing happened, they had bought the cart out now and they put me onto the board and they lifted me up. And I caught a gasp of air for a second. And I said, you know what? I just, I'll, I'll be all right. Let me give a thumbs up to the crowd. And when they gave that thumbs up and it felt like the weight of the world was on my hand. Oh, so you were immobile since, okay. Yeah. Man, it's, it's, it's crazy that you mentioned Shiano um, mentioning to you, hey, you got to talk to God right now. Mm -hmm. were, you, were you leaning on your faith prior to this event or was this... The event that really brought it to your... I always had faith. I've been always praying, believed in God, no matter what my aunt and my uncle, you know, devoted Christians, and, you know, they always try to implement that into my family. And, I, you know, I always say people, everyone has their own relationship with God. After my injury, I definitely got closer to God, that's for sure, because and I've been through some shit, let's just say <laughs> that. Been through a lot of a lot of stuff, and, um, you know, I, have, I, I pray every day, praying every morning, every night, and throughout the day, and just thankful that each and every day, because now I was put into a situation where I was in a little bubble at Piscataway, New Jersey, playing football, not knowing a thing about the outside world, to this injury happening and seeing other people in my you know, situation without the same support, without right. not, you know, thousands of people reaching out to them, helping them. And you see that and you're like, damn, these people have nobody. Look how their life got changed up, up and, you know, upside down. And it made me realize, you know, yeah, this is, I'm going through this and it sucks, but I was so thankful for my support system around me, and I always said I'll appreciate everything that ever comes my way. Speaking of your support system, who or what was like the, the, the biggest reason why you kept moving? My mom. Yeah. You know, Mama Dukes was there from day one, and, you know, I wouldn't be where I am today without her, the unconditional love that she has for me, and just whatever I need, you know, we may butt heads 35 times a day. But I know five minutes later, we'll be fine. And Mama Deuce is going to take care of it with us. Dealing with insurance because she knows I don't have time and patience to deal with, the, deal with the insurance and fighting with them and arguing with them. But all the behind the scenes stuff that goes on on a daily basis, you know, running a household. Like, she knows I don't have the patience for that stuff. So she does that. Meanwhile, you know, I'm out here trying to, you know, make a living, live my life to the fullest, not letting this wheelchair hold me back. My biggest motivation is my mom. But, of course, that, it, that also grows and extends to my family that have been there for me. They're just a phone call away. When something crazy happens, you need them. My friends who I've, I mean, they've learned how to take care of me, make sure I'm good when I go out. You know, my business partner, Brian, here, like I could be here, you know, trust that if anything happens, like I got somebody by my side. And for that, I'm always, I'm so thankful for that because a lot of people my age that don't have the means to be able to have a house rebuilt, they're stuck off somewhere in like a nursing home at 25 years old. You're like, Damn, what kind of life is that? Yeah. It, it, it's a shame that th circumstances like this are almost what mm -hmm. people need to show so much appreciation for the little things in life. You know what I mean? Like mm -hmm. I, it's funny. When you, when you came here today, the first thing that I thought about was like, wow, he's had to accept that life just moves a little bit slower. You know, from just getting into the door or in the elevator, mm -hmm. it may take you a little more time than me, and I take that for granted every day. You know, I'm rushing to the elevator. I'm not thinking about the present moment because I have somewhere to be, and I'm annoyed at something else. Whereas mm -hmm. you, you know, you were forced to just take your time. And do you think that helped you live in the moment a little more? Absolutely, because I was just like you. I didn't know anything about paralysis and the spinal cord injury before my injury, and I was always on a go. Got to get here. Got to get there. This, this, and that. And now, you said it takes a little bit longer to get off the elevator. It takes a little bit longer to get through doorways and stuff like that, but it makes you live in the moment every time that you get it because there's days when you're you know you're just sitting in your bedroom and you're like, damn, I wish I could be out doing this and this. I wish I could get in my car, go drive down to the beach if I wanted to, you know, stuff like that. So when you're in those moments and you're around good people and enjoying just events, whatever it is, 
it makes you appreciate it just a little bit more. Yeah, I'm, I'm sure your perspective on life has just dramatically mm-hmm. changed. When when you were playing for Shiano, what kind of role did he play in your life? I mean, I tell people all the time, Shiano is definitely not for everyone. I felt uh, like that's I, what I've heard. <laughs> yeah. I thought I was in the Marines. I'm like. The discipline that he instills in us and just the mental toughness. Like we always said, we may not be the most, you know, physically gifted team or most talented. But I promise you, you ain't going to find a team that's tougher than a player that plays for Shiano or smarter than a player that plays for Shiano. And, I, and it's a lot of work. People like wake up and think that, you know, my mental toughness and just the way out, my outlook on life just happened overnight. I'm like, no, that was years and years of training, playing football holding myself accountable, leadership qualities and and roles I had to play, being able to deal with failure, bounce back from that, pick myself up when things didn't go my way. So when it comes to Shiano, like, he demands excellence from us all the time. Yeah. All the time, no matter if it's in a classroom, the weight room, on the football field, he had to show excellence. So when you live like that, trained behavior becomes instinct. You just... You just become accustomed to it. That's just how you, you are. Do. You don't know anything else at this point. I really don't. I mean, those yeah. two and a half years, three years at Rutgers. Ooh, I said anything I do now in this world physically, <laughs> it won't match up to that. <laughs> that that is fun. My my little brother played ball at um, Syracuse okay. and he got injured, um, broke his leg, and so that was it. It was funny. Like he was playing D line or D tackle, just like yourself. Mm-hmm. They asked, "Can anybody step up?" He's a freshman. Can anybody step up and play O line? And he said, "I'll do it, coach." And, you know, coach looked at him and said, this is the you know epitome of a team player, right? I think it was like the week he started playing on like the scout. Mm-hmm. After the play, somebody dove, you know, took his leg out. So he couldn't play anymore. Mm-hmm. But that discipline, like that schedule and structure, you get back in the real world, you're like, what the fuck is it? You don't even yeah. know what to do. You're used to having something to do every hour of the day. So mm-hmm. it's like the sport that took you out also built you. You know, like now your life you probably need crazy structure to compare to everybody else. It's, it's so funny you say that too because literally every single day, every hour, I felt like it was blocked off. We had to show to our academic advisor every single day what yep. we had planned out for that entire day. And I remember when I finally got out of that like life, it, it was weird. I'll never forget, I got into an argument with uh, my mom. We were arguing about something and she was like, doing a, she was like maybe half-assed or something. I don't know what it was. And I looked at her, I'm like, you could never play for Rutgers football. <laughs> and, she, and she looked at me and said, I don't want to play for Rutgers football. I'm like, you know what? I'm in the real world now. Like, I was so like trained like around everyone else. Like that's, that's what so we had to funny, do. Man. She looked at me like I had to like, she like, so and <laughs> yeah, exactly. Like, what, what are you gonna do about? I'm like, you know what? You're right. And it kind of made me like, you know, ease out a little bit. Like I was just so like used to that. It just was my life. But we, now I look at it now and I'm always like, you know what, whatever I when I need to lock in on something. I can I can like snap that figure and lock in, and I do know how like when I can relax and enjoy, I know how to do that. Now. You tap it like that old sub, but I think that's the biggest problem with like any insane athlete mm-hmm. that goes through that structure and now, you know, lives the good life. It feels so good that you, you almost do the opposite now. You're like, I was so used to going through hell that I'm good with doing nothing right now. And it's mm-hmm. almost like you take that red or blue pill, and we refer to it all the time. Whenever you train anything, right? Any sort of martial art or something you have to really work hard for, for an end goal that may or may not happen. Mm -hmm. Your life is so much different than like the quote unquote average guy or girl that goes to work, kind of lives for the weekend, has a good time on the weekend. And then, oh, here's comes Monday. Your brain is wired so much differently than that. It's probably hard to like, like you said, snap back out of it. You yell at your mom like she's your team, yeah, like your teammate. That. I felt so stupid after I said that to her. <laughs> I was only a few, it was a few months after my injury, and I was just like, still like, you know, so adapted to that culture. Yeah, and I realized I'm like, yeah, I'm like not everyone is like that, but the perfect example, like you said, a fighter, they have their camp for eight weeks and they lock in, and there's nothing else that they do for that eight yep. weeks besides get ready for that fight. Yeah. And then when the outcome is over, you know, then they go live their life a little bit. That's kind of like my life now. Like when there's certain things I have to get done, I will lock into them and, you know, give them my all and I'm going to bust my ass. Right. And then when I can have a day off of doing nothing, I'll sit there and I'll put out a, a series on Netflix and just, run t- and just run through that whole series just yeah. to take my mind away, give me that mental break. Right, right. Because life is sometimes too short to just be always stressed out and I have to do this, have to do that. Mm-hmm. I got to stick to my structure. It's like, no, you don't. Mm-hmm. Sometimes you can relax. You know what I mean? Life is, mm-hmm. like you said, life above ground for you is any, any, every day is a good day. Every so. day is a good day above ground. Take, take us through <laughs> the day in the life of a Division One college football player. Huh. So it all depends on when practice. That's all. It always depends give us, on the practice schedule. Give us a schedule. real hard day of, of camp. So, oh, camp? Oh, Jesus. 
<laughs> so camp, you're up at, you know, that alarm goes off 6, 30, 7 o'clock every day. Got to get to breakfast within that first half hour. You get to breakfast, get your meal in, get right over to practice. Usually, first thing you do is go watch film from the night before. If you had to practice the night before, you're breaking down the film from the day. After that, then you'll have to, usually you have like a little lunch, a light lunch. Then you're out on that practice field, two, three hours, whatever it is. After that, you'll come back in, you'll watch that film again. They'll let you go take a nap for a little bit. Then you come back for that second session in the evening, that practice. And that day, that'll bring you to that last session. Then you have a dinner. You'll usually have a lift too some of those days. And then by the end of the day, it's around 10 p.m. So that day starts at 6.30. And you don't get done until 10 p.m. during camp. Man. You lock in for that that month of August. Oof. It's, it's, it's your life. And like it's not built for everybody. Yeah. But like I said, the things I've learned and being able to commit myself all that years and everyone that does it. It's not easy. It's not fun. But you got to do it. Yeah, well, that's the thing, too. You think you got to do it until you take a step back yeah. and realize that your mom is like, you don't have to do this. Yeah. So did you have any of those moments in camp? You're like, I don't have to be doing this at all. When I was in football, no. You always, when I, you when I was in football, I was locked in. My goal was to make it to the NFL, and I was mm-hmm. going to do whatever I had to do. And I listened to my coaches, and when my coach yelled at me, I would get pissed off and then try to go kill somebody out of the next play. And, you know, when you're going up against the same person every single day over and over again, those fights do break out in, tra- in training camp. You know what they always saw? Big brawl breaks out at Miami Dolphins football camp. Like, I look at it, I'm like, eh, that's just not, that's a normal practice day, you know? So I, when I was playing football, I there never was a thought where, you know what, I don't have to be doing this. It was, no, I want to be able to provide for my family. Mm. I want to be able to take it to the next level. I'm going to make sure I get the best out of myself. And I was committed to excellence when it came to that. I love that, man. So, so football was part of your identity at this point, right? I, I still say I have no animosity towards the game of football because it made me who I am today. How does it feel having to live without something that you were so used to having as part of your life? Hardest part about it is I, when the football season comes rolling around and the games start up again. Like, do I miss practice? Absolutely not. <laughs> do I miss training? Absolutely. <laughs> Hell no. I don't miss a thing about that. <laughs> yeah. But the locker room, oh, man, there is nothing like being in a football locker room either after a hard workout, after a game day victory. I was always the guy I had to get in the middle, get everyone going afterwards. Like that stuff, man, I miss so much. Those are the memories that will last a lifetime because Mm -hmm. it's like that brotherhood that you build with your guys, all that, the toughness and all that hard work that you just went through. It's like now you can relax and you bust balls in the locker room, have a good time. You know, people always say, you don't get what a locker room is like until you be in there. It could be the most brutal place in the world and also the most fun place. So I miss that the most, honestly. Did you feel like a, a piece of you was missing? Like, were you, were you almost lost and didn't really know who you were after football was gone? Kind of in the beginning, you know, I kind of like, like I said, the structure of not having to get up and go to like distance and that. It was, it was different. Yeah. And I felt like I wasn't able to, I was always felt like I was this big macho guy, strong guy that I wasn't able to do that anymore. But with my life, it, it got changed a whole lot and more drastic than just, say, somebody that like lost a career, but they could still go through other things. Correct. So I was still fighting for my life at the same time and trying to recover and then learn what this new life is like with a disability and a wheelchair. So I kind of was like geared my football instincts to now my recovery when it came to this injury. So what was your first year post-injury like? First year post-injury was a blur because, I mean, obviously people wanted to know my story, follow up what was going on, which was great. I will say just the amount of support was amazing. But it was now like adjusting to what am I going to do without football? But then everyone's like, focus on recovery, focus on recovery. Right. And I kind of was like, you know what? I'm going to lock in on that and, you know, recover as much as I can, do what I need to do. I was going to therapy five days a week, you know, on the treadmill, three hours a day. Like, it, it felt like football, like, Damn. but it was just a whole different lifestyle now. And that's what my main focus was. It wasn't, you know, going to, you know, my career. At the time, I was still trying to finish school. Yeah. I was taking classes via Skype and whatnot, so I didn't know what my professional career was going to look like. It was just all about my recovery and get my degree. Right. So at that point, it didn't really matter. You were just yeah, focusing on it. first year, yeah. Was it weird? Because uh, I would have to assume people started treating you differently. Was it weird in the beginning? I would say actually a little bit later. In the beginning, I didn't get treated differently much because people knew who I was in my story and everything. Right. As time went on, people still knew who I was and, you know, going out about. But it was the people who didn't know that would look at you differently. They'll give you the quick, like, like stare and then turn their head real quick. Or the ones that would just stare at you the whole time and watch you go by. You're like, what the hell? Like, bro. 
because it's something that they're not used to. Yeah. And a lot of people get uncomfortable you know, when they're in an uncomfortable situation. They don't want to ask the wrong questions. Exactly. They don't want to do anything. Yeah. How do you handle that? I'm fine. I have yeah. my confidence is, re- is is honestly ridiculous. That's the one thing. I pat myself on the back. With, As you should. Man. I don't I don't let stuff get to me, bring me down. And I, and I feel bad because other people do. Mm. And a lot of times people don't want to come out because the world looks at them differently. Me, whatever. If I need help, I need help. You look at me weird, whatever. I'll try to, you know, I'll lighten the room. People come in the room, they don't know how I'm going to act. I'm like, what you see is what you get. The handshake. People, you you were good. You didn't go out for the handshake. People will come up to me. I thought about it. See, <laughs> I, I swear to God. You I was didn't like, do it, Some people come up, they do the handshake. I'm like, I can't shake your hand. If I'm out at the bar, people get drunk. They're like, why won't you shake my hand? I'm like, I physically can't shake your hand. Yeah, I'd love and then to. And they're like, oh, my God. And then they feel bad. And it's just like. Bro, it's fine. Yeah, yeah, I don't. I wouldn't have understood either. So that's kind of how I look at it. Yeah, you got to put yourself in the other person's shoes. But even, I mean, you, you, I would assume it'd still be a life of a party. You know what I mean? You light up a room. I'm sure you did prior to this and post this. You're not going to change who you are because of your circumstances. I told myself when I was laying in a hospital bed when I was 20 years old. You know, I don't know where this life is going to take me. Where this injury is going to take me. But don't let this injury change who you are. I always, always that happy-go-lucky guy. Like you said, life at a party. Yeah, that's who I was. And I said, you know, yes, things look a little bit different now. My mom can let that change who I am. I love that, man. Like you said, we walked out the rooftop. You said, man, we throw a banger out here. <laughs> I said, hell yeah, we can. That rooftop. As soon as I saw it, you, I was like, you know what? We can have a lot of fun up there. That's here. the exact thought I have at first of all. Yeah, first time, <laughs> the first time. So, yeah, that, that's it. those are the things that you just never really know. And I'm sure it could impact everybody differently. You know, you based on who you were as a person prior, but also the support system you had around you. Like, did your mom help keep these things in your mind? Because there's plenty of moments where you can be up, but I'm sure there's plenty of moments where you can get down on yourself. There's a lot of moments I can get down on myself, and I just refuse to do it because in those moments, I think about my friends that I met along the way, people that are still here with us today and some that aren't still here with us, you know? And I think about their stories in that situation, I'm like, what can I complain about? I got my own means of transportation. I can call a company to come pick me up and drive me, be able to pay them. You know, I can start my own businesses, a foundation, speaking engagements, and write a book. Like, I can do it all this. And yes, everyone, we're all humans, so we're going to have our down moments, but I don't stay in them long at all because I realize how fortunate I am. And no matter how bad somebody's situation is, it could always be worse. No matter worse. what. Right. No matter what somebody's going through in life, some, it could always be worse. And I've seen that, so that's why I won't let myself get down. You're, you're a constant reminder of that, man. Were you always this entrepreneurial and this business focused? I really wasn't because my focus for the first, from the time I started playing football, I was five till I was 20, was the NFL. Like, that, that, that was, was it. it. Yeah. Like, that, I mean, obviously, that, that sets you up well financially, but that was it. I want to say two years into my injury, excuse me, um, is when I started like thinking, okay, what am I going to do in my career? Mm-hmm. And people wanted to hear me. So I remember, like, I've always been a good storyteller, and I know how to like tell my story. People want to know more, the details, the, the grittiness of it. So I was like, you know, I can start a motivational speaking career. And in the beginning, I remember I used to tell my story, but I would tell it, blah, 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 and I would not pause and just like <laughs> go all out. And people couldn't feel like you know the dramatic pause, the pause that I need to emphasize into my speeches and stuff like that. But they're like wow, you have one hell of a story and an experience, a life-changing moment that you went through. Mm. And I just started doing it over and over and over again. And, you know, that's how I pay my bills, my, my speaking engagements. Yeah, I'm building brands and whatnot for the future. But, you know, being able to speak has been, been able to allow me to do what I do for the past, geez, 12, 12 years now. <laughs> then writing the book. And then when I really started to dive into, you know, my entrepreneurship, I was during the pandemic. Right, right. What are most of your speaking engagements about? Overcoming adversity? Adversity, leadership, teamwork, being able to, the conf- confidence in yourself. Mm-hmm. You know, so I've spoken from all the way to kindergarten kids to Fortune 500 companies. My story is my story, but if you tell me something that you want me to focus on, I'll make sure I emphasize those moments in my story and also lessons I've learned, you know after you know the initial two three years of my injury you know what i love about hearing you speak is and i could assume you happen to be in a wheelchair that's not all you are you know what i mean you can talk about teamwork talk about confidence and you could have been that guy prior to this anyway Mm -hmm. and that's what i would like to see you know like i the Mm -hmm. the story 
is heartfelt and obviously it's inspiring, but mm -hmm. I want to know more about you. I don't want to just know, mm -hmm. like, hey, what it's life like post injury mm -hmm. like this. You know, you've separated yourself from the injury and I'm mm -hmm. sure that's so great for you to do. And I'm sure other people that are in your circumstances should probably try to do the same thing. Well, I appreciate that. It means a lot. And I, and I say the type of person I am, you know, I work hard, I grind, I, I'm, I don't, I'm not afraid of anything. So I'm not afraid of a challenge. I'm not afraid of hard work or something that doesn't go my way and people fold in those moments. No, I try to learn from it and not make the same mistake twice. Take leaps of faith as we get into my business. I, did I know a thing about bourbon? Nope. Did I know a thing about coffee? Absolutely not. Yeah. And here I am with two businesses because I'm not afraid to learn and make mistakes and then grow from them. I'm yeah. just not. Yeah, it, it, taking on two, not only one, but two different businesses, <laughs> it just, again, how could you, how could anybody else complain? You know what I mean? You got your <laughs> schedule packed up. Which one has, has been more fun, the coffee or the bourbon? I mean, drinking bourbon. I mean, Why it not? doesn't get more fun than that, obviously. Yeah. So if it's coffee now, this is a different ballgame because it's a seven-day operation with a brick and mortar, and you're literally have, relying on my staff to run because it's not like... When somebody calls out, I can't get up and get behind the counter and make you a latte. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I can't do it. I can't do it. So let's just say it's a little bit more stressful relying on so many other people yeah. that have to, you know, do it. And I remember being out at my, at my birthday last year, and I'm not going to lie, I was hammered. I was drinking perfect and enjoying my birthday on <laughs> Labor Day weekend. And then my manager's like, Eric, the refrigerator broke. And I'm just like, shit. Like I'm not like that's you type can't of do stuff. anything at this point. I'm like, what am I gonna do? You know, right. I'm like, I'm like, I'm like, we'll deal with that tomorrow type of type of thing. Figure it out until then. Yeah. But when it comes to bourbon, like it's like it's, it's totally different when it comes to like the stress levels. You know, it's focusing on sales, making sure okay, somebody bought in the product, are they drinking that? How are we moving it off the shelf, doing things like that. And that's why I bring in my business partner. I, the reason why I reached out to him because I know he knows all this stuff. He knows how to do it. So the things that I physically can't do. Brian has been in this business so long, he doesn't have to do this, but he's driving to accountants, showing up and this and that because I put my trust in him. We're, right. yeah, we can, we're not, we're very humble. We're not like, oh, we're too good to do this or we're too good to do that. So I surround myself with people that I trust and believe in right. that can do the physical things that I can't do. Yeah. I can use my brains, I can come up with ideas. That I can reach out to people like I'm fully independent at home on myself or only with a device kind of like this that hooks it up and brings the phone to my face. I can do all my stuff like that. But like jumping in the car and going here and this or like I said, getting behind the counter. I can't do so. I got to surround myself with people I trust. Right. And I am assume I can't speak for Brian, but you probably motivate one another. You know what I mean? Like for him to try to be like, oh, well, I'm a little tired right now. I don't want to get up. When you're asking yeah. him to do something, he's probably like, yeah, I, I can't. Even yeah, Brian, you're over there right now. Have, I, have we had a fight yet? <laughs> No, we have. I get a fight with him. <laughs> I know like, we haven't. Said, I, we have not had a fight yet, and that's no. It's been great, and you know when it came to like my coffee business, like I've had to fire people and stuff like that. And I'm such a nice guy. That's honestly the hardest part for yeah. me. Is like I want to work with you as much as I possibly just just do the right thing. I saw I said like, you do the right thing, we'll get along. It's when you're not doing the right thing, you're not caring, and I'm like, now I got to be the asshole, and I don't like being an asshole, no. but I got to do it. Yeah. Coffee's tough. I mean, co coffee's margins are incredible, but it's, it's tough because everybody's got a coffee shop. Brick and mortar. Is, uh, the coffee margins, yeah, if I could just sell a cup of coffee, it's everything, everything else that comes with yeah, that running exactly. the brick and mortar that yeah. you're like, damn, man, like, how am I going to make make money off it? And then you start to figure out ways. Yeah. And everyone's like, don't worry, it gets better. Because the first year, you're like, what the hell did I get myself into? And they're like, stay at it. It gets better. Now we're on year three, and I'm kind of looking, I'm like, you know what? I can kind of see the light. It's coming out, but it's, it's still a grind. And you have your good days, you have your bad days. You have, you know, July and August. I remember when I first opened the business, didn't realize July and August were the months that everyone goes on vacation. Yeah. And man. like, you're like, oh, we crushed it in May. We crushed it in June. So I came in like, what happened? Where did everybody go? Whatever, yeah, where, where is everybody? <laughs> yeah. But then that's why you got to keep you coming up with different pitches, collaborations, this and that that you're offering. Right. And then you got consistency. The best part about it is I go to my coffee shop and people don't even know I own it. Cause that's when you know you got a business. People that just Googled it. They live in the area. They live in the build. They come down. Yeah. I have no clue. I even own. It. I'm like, love that. That's that's a good feeling, right? It stands on its own. <laughs> G give a quick shout out for the coffee shop. Where is it? What's it called? LeGrand Coffee House in Woodbridge, New Jersey. It's right. my hometown. Where I was born and raised. And I wanted to make sure I had something in my hometown. So, if you're in the area, go to LeGrand Coffee House or if you're online. We because we built our brand online first. We you did. sold all 50 states. Yeah, because I launched it in January 2021. I didn't wait for want to wait for the brick and mortar to be built. Mm. Wanted to build a brand before that. So we sold all 50 states now. So wherever online, store to LeGrandCoffeeHouse.com. What made you even want to get involved with coffee? I said in order to have my mic. The pandemic was nuts. I'm like, everyone hates each other. This sucks. 
what can I do to bring motivation to people every day? Like, I had a t-shirt company, Shop 52, and I had these role model shirts that everyone wore. But how often do you wear a t-shirt? You know, two, three times a month, maybe. maybe. Yeah, yeah. Maybe. And I'm like, how can I, like, motivate people? Like, to just, like, like live life every day with just that appreciation. Mm-hmm. And so, what do they want and what do they need? Coffee. Everybody. Literally went on Google, Google Coffee Business Advisor. That's crazy. Founder business advisor, police bill, coffee business advisor out of Portland. And my and Matt Maletto is my guy now. He's my friend. But I had to take courses and learn this. And it took me four times to pass the course. And I'm like, you know what? I think I'm ready. I'm going to give it a shot. And that first month, I mean, the demand was crazy. I went with a local roaster who my business advisor advised me against doing because he said he probably is not going to be able to keep up with demand. I'm like, ah, he'll be fine. Yeah. I think I got the gray hairs that you can see now. <laughs> It was from that first month of business. I had to let him go and then moved on and things, you know, started to get better and better from there. But we built it online first and then the brick and mortar. Now we are open now going on year three. Wow. That's, I, yeah, I, I would always thought, because I always am intrigued by stuff like that too. Like, man, open up a coffee shop sounds so much fun. And then you do it, you're like, what the fuck am I getting myself into? Yeah, it's like after like the, after the newness wears us, that's why I like, you know, I pride myself like after the newness wears off, can you stay consistent to the right. grind? Because so many people love the idea and a fad or something. But once that newness wears off, same with the bourbon. Like the bourbon when we launched, like, oh my God, you have a bourbon. Okay, now what's like when that newness wears off? Like what's next? How do you stay consistent? How do you grow? Mm-hmm. Why bourbon over every other liquor? Yeah, I, like I said, it, it fits me. I enjoy it. Like I always tell, love to tell a story. When I was in my younger 20s, what did I drink? Shots of Jack. I'm like, Used to rip shots of Jack oh. when you're out and stuff like that. <laughs> then I went over to tequila as I got into my upper 20s and stuff like that. But now I'm in my 30s now. I'm like, you know what? This is more of a gentleman's drink. Sophisticated, even though, right? Yeah. Even though I, people are like, you're not supposed to do shots of bourbon. I'll still do it. I'll do my shots of bourbon. I'll drink it neat. I'll drink it on the rocks. And then I'm out to dinner drinking it in a cocktail. Like, I love the, the versatility of it. We got some really cool stuff that we're going to be doing. You know, there's so many things you could do, whether it's with a rye or single barrel and things mm. like that. So... Brian and I got some things cooking. Yeah, you can't share? Can you, can you share any of these things that are cooking or what? Uh, can we share it yet? <laughs> I'm about to say, yeah, no. We, we're working on something for the holidays where we're going to do with a single barrel with a certain proof, with, let's just say, some certain numbers that are really near and dear to my heart. So we're coming up with something for the holidays That's and awesome. different label, all that stuff to really get people excited about. All right, well, listen, if we can help in any way, you, you, uh, you let me know. You'll get a bottle. Don't worry. All right. That's all I'm looking for. I just want to buy <laughs> If you, dead or alive, could share a drink with one person, who would it be? I mean, I've met some great people over the years, and it's a guy that I, I met, and I know him, and we tweeted back and forth. But I would love to talk to The Rock I went over a drink. I've met him in person. He said, like, you know, we tweeted back and forth at each other before. But to share stories and sit down like we're talking right now and how he does it, obviously yeah. he's fully capable, able body, but still the wear and tear and what he's doing – is incredible, dude. It's all over the place. Monster, I mean, his marketing bro. game is insane. Obviously, he is a brand. Like he's he's a brand himself. Yeah. But I would love to just be able to hear the hustle, most of like the backstories and stuff. What happens when things don't go right with the rock? How do you bounce back from that? Like when you do stuff, do stuff on such levels where it has to be explosive, like a pop that Every you know time. millions of people love. What happens when you don't get that pop? Yeah. Like, like, I would love to hear just some ideas like that. People are probably waiting for it, too. You know what I mean? Like, they're mm-hmm. waiting for something to get fucked up with him. Exactly. Because everything he does is perfect. Everything. There's no scandals, nothing. Everything. Maybe he's on steroids. Okay, yeah, great. <laughs> that, that's how you got him? No shit. But, like, other exactly. than that, he's such a clean dude. I'd love to hear. He just seems just like, like such a presence in the room. You know what I mean? Another just the guy one, you want to share, uh, share a conversation with. Got to give you one more is MJ because we don't hear much about Michael Jordan. We know yeah. that man has a lot of money. We know he's the greatest in his mindset when it came to basketball. And we know that he's been caught up in some stuff, but yeah. he stays out of the crowd. Like, I want to go on a fishing trip with MJ. Just to see if he talks. I want to be on a boat. Yeah. I want to I would have smoke a cigar with him. Like, I would, I would love to hear his stories and what he's seen. Like, that would be so cool because he doesn't share it with the public. With anybody, dude. Nobody. Yeah, I heard he's very closed off. Not that I, I would know. Yeah, nobody that I know has, has talked to him. I got to get on that. I got to get on one of his fishing trips. How do you know, bro? Come on. Reach out yeah, to him. We'll see. One day. I mean, it's Michael damn Jordan. Shoot him a DM, bro. I'm sure he'll see it. Oh, yeah, I'm sure. <laughs> So where, when did you start the, the bourbon, by the way? Three so we ago? launched in March of 2023. Brian oh, and I wow. have been, I mean, working on this since probably 2021, 20, end of 2021. So we started the idea and all that. And then we had to go through the process. And obviously, I knew nothing about it. So I'm working with Brian coming up with the bottle, the labeling, 
the juice where it's going to come from. Yeah. Now we're going through and getting investors involved with just a dream. Like we had no bottle, no liquid, no anything. But we, you know, sold him on a dream of my story and Brian's, you know, his abilities in this field. And like, you know what? People believed in us and we took a leap of faith and we were able to purchase some bourbon. We got a great, you know, great company that we work with in Bardstown, out in Kentucky. Oh. You know, getting a river, the juice from Green River Distillery, who's owned by Bardstown. So we we're able to, you know, go through a broker with Brendi Amo to bring them on. So Brian, using Brian's connections, we we're able to come up with some great juice. And, you know, I always say, so I want something smooth. Nothing that when you take a sip of it, you're like, ah, I'm like, I don't know how many I can have of these. Yeah. Something that can, you can mix with stuff, and that's exactly what we got. I remember I got, we got at 115 proof to try it out. <laughs> right. And I said, I was like, yeah, I was like, Brian, I don't know, man. Like, I'm, 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 like, I'm just about to say it's like rubbing alcohol. I don't know. That'll light your eyes. And I, I took a sip, <laughs> and it went down smooth. I said, Really? I said, Let me get another one. And everyone starts laughing. I took it out. I almost took down the whole sample. What had anybody else getting any? And I'm like, you know what? We got something here. We proofed it down to 88. I was about to say, make, this, it more this is... make it more approachable for you know people that are in the bourbon world, but also respectable for the bourbon drinkers. Yeah, yeah. And also the people that may not be bourbon drinkers, they can they can try it, they can enjoy it, and then mix it with the cocktail. That's it. Well, I want I want to give you some. Can I? Can I? Can I give you a Come glass? Come on of this? over, here, bro. You can chug that thing. <laughs> <laughs> Let me see how we do this. Hold on. I know. I see you over there taking all the sips. I know. I was like, this, like thirsty. Hold on. I know. I can't, I can't share a drink without you. Okay, we're going to get a cheers. Yeah. Cheers to, cheers to you coming over here. Yeah, absolutely. I appreciate you, man. No, I appreciate you. Let me chug this thing. I love it. Thank Did you. Did I give you enough or that was, that no, was no, not solid. enough? That was, that was perfect. perfect. Right. I don't want to. I don't want to force chug you. Yeah, I'm, I'm so used to like, especially when we're out, like, Harry drinking. I'm, like, <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> I'm sure your boys perfect. are always fucking with you, really. Yeah. Always. So that was perfect. No, good. All you. right. Good. That's funny though, man. It, it's probably good to have guys that, regardless of what you're going through, can still kind of bust your balls about it. You know what I mean? Uh, I. It's it's so normal to me, but everywhere I go, I love to share this story. I'm in a group message, and Brian knows him now. He's part of our crew. There's 14 of us that we've known since we were five years old. Pretty much five years old. It's we awesome. talk all day. When I get back home, I'll be I'll come home to 250 text messages. Yep. I have everyone ripping. If our group messages, I don't even want to put this out there. Gets out there ever. Act, we're all going to jail. Yeah. <laughs> like, like it's bad. It's bad in there. But there's 14 of us that we talk all day, every day. And we Ryan said when we're gonna raise the money, like we want to get our family and friends involved. You know, we got them invested in the company. That's awesome. So they're out at all the events with us, having fun party, and bring them bring them along with us. So. I wouldn't be what I am without them, man. Those are my guys and the ladies, everyone. They're, they help me so much, man. I just love them. That's so cool. It's the same thing for me, man. 14 years old. I have 14 guys in my group chat. It's like you never – there's so much that, you know, life could could get pretty shitty sometimes. Mm -hmm. And you lean on your boys just to have a good time and get a laugh at a, something that may be really serious. You know what yeah. I mean? And everybody else is giving this poor pity party. Mm -hmm. The rest of the world is saying, poor, poor Eric. Mm -hmm. And your boys are like, poor Eric. No, he's good. No, they you know, love, like, we're going to have a good time regardless. Me. They love to rip because I give it, I, man, let something, let something happen. I, I'm going to be the first one going in on somebody. So when something <laughs> happens with me, forget it. Oh, I get no. hit from all directions. They love it. Oh, I'd have a, dude, that's so fun. I'd love to see you with your boys out of the bars. Oh, you'll see us. Don't worry. You'll have a good time. I'll just have this rooftop party with me. <laughs> yeah. Have them rolling, man. Yeah, that's, that's awesome, bro. How, um, how much progress have you made since PT? I mean, from the beginning, man, I can barely even. Move my neck. I was in a, in a neck brace. I was on a ventilator. Ooh. They told me I'll never come off the ventilator. Never eat solid foods. This and that. And you know, about a month into my injury, I, st I came off the ventilator. Then I got the feeding tube out of me. That I got hurt on October sixteenth, that Thanksgiving. I was able to eat a full solid meal. Then came full range of motion back in my neck. Then started shimmy shaking shoulders and stuff like that. So things have come back for me. People are like, what is therapy like now for you? I'm like, you know how you go to the gym to stay in shape. That's me. I, I keep my body strong, healthy, blood circulating, muscles contraction, doing physical therapy, occupational therapy. For one day when we do find that cure, I'll be ready. You know, whatever I can, whatever I can do to control myself, right. I'll do. Right. Everything else I got to leave in God's hands. Obviously, when it comes to nerves and neuro, that's a whole different ballgame. I got to leave to the doctors and right. a, med a, miracle, a medical miracle. But that's why I have a foundation, Team LeGrand and the Christopher Dana Reed Foundation, to keep on raising funds to be able to push that, you know, a little bit closer. I feel like that when Christopher Reeve died and then my story came about, like it was kind of like the torch got passed to me that I got to continue to do that. And since we launched in 2013, September 2013, 
We've raised close to now $3 million to spinal cord injury research. So just got to keep on going, making more people aware of it because there's 5.6 million Americans that are dealing with some sort of paralysis. And I feel like I'm like the face of that. And I got to yeah. use my voice and platform to be able to raise that awareness and fun. So one day we can live Christopher Reeves' dream. And that's a world of empty wheelchairs. That's incredible, man. It's, it's funny. I don't want to bring up religion too, too much because habit always every podcast it gets brought up in some capacity. But I was at church the other day mm -hmm. and he was mentioning, you know, things like that where we lean and we're always, you never lose your faith regardless of how bad mm -hmm. it gets. But that doesn't mean you go the opposite route and only rely on your faith, right? Mm -hmm. Doctors and medicine exist for a reason. Mm -hmm. If you want to believe that God put it out there, then you have mm -hmm. to rely on that sort of stuff too. So you saying, hey, I believe in God and have faith and trust that whatever he wants for me is going to happen and it's going to mm -hmm. be the best for me doesn't mean that now you're ignoring what doctors can do for you. you yeah, know? no, it's definitely. It's going to take God blessed doctors to be able to find that cure for us. It's not like it's just going to just happen. No. Right. It's the people that are working tirelessly behind the scenes. I probably have no idea who they are. Yeah. But they're in a lab somewhere trying to figure out, you know, different ways on how to, you know, find a cure for ALS, paralysis, cancer, yeah. you know, things like that. So there's so many different causes out there, and I'm just trying to be the voice of mine and help yeah. so many people that are dealing with this. So... When you say, because again, you said you can't really even move your mm -hmm. neck or eat. Yeah. First of all, I want to know what was your first meal? Oh, cheeseburger, French fries, Hell cheeseburger, yeah. ketchup, only French fries. I I have like a five year old pal. Like now, I've grown up where I eat. <laughs> I, I always have a carnivore, like when you know steak, chicken, you know pork. Like I'm tearing up, you know. Yeah, there's like a barbecue that. spot and, right over here. Yeah, see barbecues. You're talking like when it comes to veggies and all that rabbit food, and <laughs> I eat my spinach, I eat my collard greens, I eat my string beans. Other than that, that's why I, I lived off that as a kid. I got big and strong. I like Popeye off the spinach. But all that other mm, celery, lettuce, and onion, eh, nah, I'm good. Yeah. But, all, but other than that, you know, after that, I had my, my soul food Thanksgiving with the family. That was awesome. That's so cool. Oh, that, that must have felt so good. That, that It meal. really was. Like to be able to eat that mac and cheese and the cornbread and all <laughs> oh the sweet potatoes. Oh, uh, I'm, I'm sure stuff. your family was just, uh, you know, oh. they probably liked watching you eat more than themselves. They you know? did. They were very, you know, would be able to have that Thanksgiving. I was at, I was at Kessler. I was at inpatient rehab at the time. And for them to be able to come up there, they brought the party to me. And oh, they did? Yeah, oh, we, so cool. we had like this reserved like conference room. And yeah. Everyone came in. My, my family was like 12 of us. And we had our Thanksgiving at Kessler that year and Christmas. Hey, listen, man, that, that's, mm -hmm. yeah, again, a, a blessing you were able to, to mm -hmm. share that with them. What, when I mentioned, you know, progress, or you mentioned that you're now able to move your neck and things like that, is there any progression that you're seeing as of recently that you haven't been mm -hmm. able to do? I want to say every, like, every now and then, like when you're laying in bed at night and you're watching TV, like I try to get my hands to move and I see sometimes I get like a, finger to twitch and I even got like a few toes before to like twitch out like nothing significant where it's like moving it controlling but yeah. I've seen like when I went to move and you can see a little like a, so I always try to explain like the spinal cord you know how you have a plug like a charger mm -hmm. and when you fray it and it's like you know, like it works sometimes you got to put it on this angle for it to work that's kind of <laughs> like the spinal cord like I, I damage my spinal cord so it's like the signals are trying to get down but they can't get all the way to Right. The muscles that, that you're trying to get to. And every now and then, maybe you can get a little faint signal all the way down. And that's kind of like what it's like. Uh, yeah. Well, I mean, I was going to ask you, what is that feeling compared to? Like not being able to move something that you were so used to being able to move without yeah. even thinking. I know. It's 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 obviously it's now, 13 years in, I'm kind of used to it. But in the beginning, like you go to do stuff and you literally can't do it. Yeah. The hardest thing is two things. Temperature control. A lot of people don't realize this. Secondary complications that come with spinal cord injuries. I messed up my central nervous system as well. So I can't regulate my temperature. So most of the time I'm always cold. Like I don't sweat either. I like you see I get real glossy. Yeah. But I don't drip sweat. The gray skin. So I don't yeah. <laughs> Black don't crack, baby. Uh, listen, all my bad <laughs> friends, they all say they come on camera like guys are so crack, fucking good baby. on camera. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, so like I get real like like oily, but I can't sweat. Huh. So when it's hot out. I can't cool my body temperature down, so I literally can pass out and literally stroke and die, have a stroke and die. So I gotta be careful, obviously, on temperature. And when it's cold, forget it. It sucks because when I get a chill, it's not like you go inside, put a like a blanket on, and you warm. No, I gotta sit in front of my heater for hours before my body can finally warm up. So people come up in my room. My room goes from seventy-seven to eighty degrees. Right now it's seventy-seven for the summer. Winter time that thing's up to eighty, and people die in there. But 
Hey, fits for me. That's just my spot. They got to deal with I it. I call it hashtag spot court problems. Yeah, I'm sure that's, that's definitely, I'm sure there's plenty of them. That's, that's, that's definitely yeah. one of them. What does it feel like for your body though? Cause you don't, mm. like, can you recognize that? Hey, it's hot out today. Oh yeah. Right away. So I mean, my, I can still feel from my you know, face, chest yeah. down. Yeah. So right away, like it's, it's a different sensation I feel, but like, it's crazy when you have a spot court, you say like, I went, I, if I broke my leg, I would get a rush to my head where my blood pressure is like shooting up mm. to let me know some, something is wrong. Can't tell you where it's at, but that's when you're like, okay, what, like you start looking around like, what, what, what happened here? Like it's like a rush to your head, like almost like when you get a headache. Yeah. It's like something, something mm. happened, something's wrong. That's so always like, okay, check this, check that. That's, a ne- again, things I was never, body's, never The body's amazing. About. Like even though it, my nerves can't let me know exactly the pinpoint where it's at, the body will still somehow find a way to know that something's wrong. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I would just assume that, you know, again, trying to move your hand when mm-hmm. you can, it's almost like just trying to move something that has never been mobile. Like mm-hmm. if I try to move my ear and make it, you know, I just, I can't yeah, do that yeah. physically. Yeah. It doesn't matter how much I try and think about it. It's just not moving. It's, it's kind of how it is. And then your sense is heightened. Like my vision, like, I don't know what it is. Like, I feel like I can see like an owl, like an owl oh, really? my hearing. Like people could be whispering over there. I can fully hear their conversation. That's so crazy. Sometimes. Yeah, it's, it's unbelievable. Sometimes I could literally, people could be talking over there. It's loud and I can fully hear their conversation. What is it like? Does, does does getting intoxicated change at all? See, that's what I, I mean. For me, not really. I still, it's felt like we were there with a farm my injury. And I, I mean, is it the best? Probably not, but that's just like anybody else. That's why I'm like, I'm not any medication where it's causing me, that's going to cause this drastic issue where yeah. if I drink, like, no. That's why I kind of said I kind of want to end that stigma because I can still drink and enjoy stuff. And, enjoy life, and yeah. then obviously you do everything in moderation. I'm not like out getting hammered every night. I mean, I'll mess up anybody. Yeah. But yeah, so I'm fortunate enough where I can still go out and have a cocktail and, and have fun. Meet new girls, new guys. Exactly, yeah. man. Go out there, meet new girls, have a good time. Yep, yeah, man. <laughs> We have a blast, believe me. All right, we we gotta, have fun. We gotta, we, we, have gotta, fun. we gotta have a night out then together sometime. <laughs> what are what? So you mentioned like the whole like hashtag spinal cord problems. What's something that you deal with like the temperature thing on a day to day basis that somebody like me just wouldn't even know? My morning routine. That's the that's the most invasive, most humbling thing I've ever had to deal with as a man, as a person. Having a nurse have to come in to get you up, get you in a shower chair, and wash you up. Help you go to the bathroom, all of that stuff, get back in the bed, get you dressed, and then back into a chair, which is all takes me two and a half, three hours every day, every morning. So if I have a 7 a.m. flight to Miami, I'm up at 2.30, 3 o'clock in the morning getting ready to get to the airport on time. That's the stuff that people don't see. It's two and a half hours, no matter what, every morning. Brian knows, don't text me. I get up usually around 7.30, 8 o'clock. I'm out on my phone until after 10, 10.30. So my day usually starts at 10 to 30 because I'm up, yes, but yeah. I'm going through my routine. And all my friends know that. My manager, coffee shops, everyone knows you're not going to get me on a normal day unless I have to be somewhere earlier. Then I'm up at, you know, 5, 6, 7 o'clock to get ready for a 9 o'clock event. That is that, the, the, you, right, know the thing you don't think about, right? The most humbling, like I said, to have somebody have to wash your own ass <laughs> compared to being able to do it yourself and get ready and, 15, 20 minutes and go is the most humbling thing that I've had to go through. Who's that person for you right now? I have my nurses. I mean, my nurses are awesome. Yeah. I got these these African ladies and I got a Caribbean lady in there. They they are amazing to see what they do, like the, especially one Clementine. She like, used to leave her kids like with her family and travel all around the country and yeah. the world with me to make sure I'm still living a good life and stuff like that. And just the sacrifices that they make waking up at because they don't have to get up at 2, 3 a.m. in the morning to come get me ready, but they know, you know, how important my life is to me, and they do yeah. it. They make the sacrifices with me working with me. So I have a nurse for three hours in the morning and an aide for eight hours. So their aide is there from 8 to 4 or stuff, things like that, and the, and the nurse is there from 8 to 11. Then it's, after that, I'm by myself. And, well, my mom is there and stuff and friends until 11, and I get somebody that comes overnight and gets me to bed, and then if I need them throughout the night. That's the stuff that people don't see. You don't even think about it. Yeah. And you're not a small guy. I mean, you were 6'2". No, I'm six. not. I was 6'2", six, six, 275 when I got injured. 
And I remember after my injury when I was eating real good, too many grease truck sandwiches, I got up to 290. Then I dropped down to about 230. And I say right now, probably between 250, 260. Yeah. I want to get down to that 240 ranges for me. But I will say, I've always been, even before my injury, I've always, I could gain weight and lose people. Like, I don't know, I hate you. You could, I could gain weight, I could lose weight. Same thing now. I just enjoy life right now. I like to eat. So if I wanted to really go strict on it and just eat some grilled chicken and spinach, like I said, then. I could lose the weight, but yeah. I mean, I'm enjoying my steaks too much. It's so funny, man. Like, again, there's things that we don't think about, mm -hmm. the differences, but then there's so many similarities. Mm -hmm. You know, like you saying, now I'm a little heavy right now. I wouldn't mm -hmm. even think that'd be a thought in your mind to be even be concerned about it. But mm -hmm. everybody's, just, you know, mm -hmm. guys are still guys, and you still worry about the same exactly, things. Exactly, man. It's just, I still, just, like I said, my mind is still the same person that it was. And, you know, obviously I've matured a little bit, I think. But it's still... I still do things that you physically can't do anymore when you think about it. Sometimes you think it can get to you, but I'm like, you know what? Don't let it get to you. You know, you can still live good life. You can still do this. And, you know, I've had girlfriends over the years, too. Like, I've been in relationships even after my dreams. Like, people are willing to understand and learn. And you're thankful for them. It makes you also realize the people that are there for that, the good reasons, and also people that can be trying to find you for the fame. So, 100%. I was just about to ask you, like, mm -hmm. what is... You mentioned your girlfriends. What was mm -hmm. dating like post this? I mean, I was dating a girl at the time. We still, uh, for five months and when I, my injury happened, but we were friends for like a year and a half. We dated for three years, but she lived in a different country, Canada. So after she moved back home for a little bit, you know, did the long distance, didn't work out. Then dated another girl that was actually in Arizona. We'll come back in here. It was like one time I was like thinking like, am I going to move to Arizona? And then she was thinking, am I going to move to New York? And we were like, no, nah, like it wasn't going to work. And, it just it wasn't cool, and then you know, have I hooked up with girls? And yes, of course. But like I said, do I jump on every opportunity? Everyone knows, no. Yeah. I'm actually very picky. Like if I'm gonna let you in my life and be, and be invasive into everything that I have to deal with, I gotta fully trust you and make sure you have good intentions and a pretty good bit on my judgment of character. So I have kind of like realized, you know, like okay, who's in it for the good and who's in like yeah, like can we, can we hang out? Yeah, we can hang out. But I'm not going to go further than just hanging out and going places, no. Picky guy, man. I, I'm really, for me to wife you up, I got to know. I, I'm a, I don't take chances. Has it been harder to pick up girls? Uh, I mean, with social media now, it's really not that, that much hard <laughs> because it's more accessible. Like, you can reach out to people. Like, if I say it wasn't social media, like when I grew up, yeah. I mean, when I was younger, it wasn't social media. Like, you, you dated people that you knew in high school, and then right. MySpace came out. That's when, like, you first like, started seeing the people from other states and mm -hmm. stuff. But now, I mean, with social media, you can always you try, probably find somebody that is interested, and you never know where it could lead to. But, like right. I said, very picky. Yeah, well, I mean, listen, you got to be, but it's got to be a special girl. Exactly. Because, I mean? like I said, it's not like a situation. Like I said, like, if I'm letting you in my life, you're like, you're going to see me getting into my hoyer lift, getting into my bed, seeing what that is like with my nurses, and then. If you're cool with that, awesome. If you're not, totally get it. Understandable. Right. It's not the easiest life. Life ain't easy. Yeah, I, that makes sense. Like having a wall up for you is like, look, I can't let you in. I can't just let anybody I into can't. my life. You I know, can't. seeing things that I don't want everybody to see, and mm -hmm. I gotta trust and be vulnerable with you from like day one. You know what I mean? Like mm -hmm. you gotta see some things that I'm not comfortable with anybody seeing. Mm -hmm. And my friends too, man. They they let me know right away. E nah, man, we ain't feeling her. E, e like, nah. <laughs> I don't know about that one, Brian. This one over here, making sure. I stay out of trouble like eating. Don't DM that person. And you're like, nah, maybe. Like, maybe. <laughs> I had a few drinks. I don't but know. But she looks good. <laughs> <laughs> That's crazy. I would love again. I'd love to see you maneuver a bar with your boys. <laughs> yes. Oh, man. Most of them are all, they're all wiped up now, too. So oh, it's funny. They, even before they were, and then now, like, now they're obviously, they're more tame, but they still all have a good time. They just bust balls with me. Yeah. They play bodyguard for you, I'm sure. Yeah. A little wingman action. That's great, man. Yeah, look, like I said, I, I, I've loved every minute of this conversation. It's inspiring. It's motivating. It's humbling even hearing your perspective, right? Like mm -hmm. saying how long your morning takes makes me almost feel guilty that like I rush through my morning and get pissed mm -hmm. off when I can't do certain things. I'm like, nah. you got such a blessed life, man, to be able to just move your body the way you want to move your body. So thank you for being vulnerable with me and sharing you know, those sort of things. Mm -hmm. I ask every guest two questions. Mm -hmm. throughout your life, you know, irregardless of, or you can include this, what has been the highest of your highs and what has been the lowest of your lows? You can start with what's been the lowest of your lows. The lowest of my lows, obviously, this injury. Right. I mean, this was life-changing moments. Like I said, I, I broke my arm and, you know, my, that was it. No, this was 
a life changing moment where I really had to build myself back up and create an identity for myself. For the people who didn't know Eric LeGrand, yes, I had my so my friends, my family, and my teammates, and people that knew me, the Fit Rockers community, which has been amazing. They knew me, but the outside world didn't know me. And I've been able to create a life for myself from building myself from the lowest of low moments of not knowing where my life was going to take me and being on a ventilator at 20 years old to being able to have, you know, whole world people supporting me. And then the highest of highs, I mean, it feels still like the best is yet to come, especially with this mm. injury. But, I mean, going to the ESPYs and being on in there, in 2012, I was only 21 years old at the time. And speaking in front of obviously thousands of people there, but millions of people watching and being able to really get my story out there mm -hmm. to the world, that opened up so many opportunities in the early stages of my injury that, I mean, that moment went from people looking at me when I first got there, like, oh, I think I know what that is, to the after party, chugging sh shots with the Gronk brothers and everyone wanted to take a picture with me and all these celebrities and athletes want to take a picture with me at the after party at the celebrities. That was insane. That's awesome, man. Well, again, thank you so much for coming on. That's it for today, everybody. Like, subscribe, share all the good stuff. Cheers. Peace.